Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. The title of the message this morning is Washed Robes, a Laundry of Love. Revelation chapter 7. And we will begin uh, in verse 13 here momentarily. The past few weeks we have been learning about the great multitude which no man could number. And that stood before the throne of God and before the Lamb. And we have seen how this multitude was the church of Jesus Christ. It's us. Here in Revelation chapter 7 that we're reading and studying about. And which had apparently been raptured up to heaven prior to the Lord Jesus Christ pouring out his wrath in judgment upon this lost world. Last week we saw how the church of God worshipped God and worshipped the Lamb and thanked Him uh, for saving their souls. And we saw how the angels joined in that worship with them, also praising God for the salvation of His church. And now, God willing, we will continue our exposition of chapter 7, beginning in verse 13, as we learn more about the great blessings that belong to this great multitude. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you, Father, for the Sunday school time you've already given us, for the word of God we've already heard, for the singing and the worship, dear Lord God, that we've already experienced, dear Lord. We thank you for all the wonderful things you've done for us. We thank you, Father God, for the great promise of salvation you've given us in Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father God, for the church, dear Lord God, that he uh, founded and that the gates of hell shall not prevail against. We're thankful, dear Lord God, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who have joined with us this morning, Father God, to open up your precious word and to hear, Father, what you have to say to us from heaven, to those here, Lord, on earth. Lord, open our ears and our minds and our hearts this morning and help us to tune out everything else, dear Lord God, that would compete, Father, with your word. May all eyes be upon Jesus. And it's in his precious name I ask this, Father. Amen. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13. It says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? So one of the elders who's round about the throne, we've already studied that before, who remember, I believe, represents the, crea uh, the redemption of the human race from the earth, the redemption of man. One of these elders poses these questions to John. I guess it's one question in two parts. He asked John two things about this great multitude. He asked him first, what are these which are arrayed in white robes. And then he asked second, whence came they? In other words, who are these people wearing these white robes and where did they come from? Now, we have already seen that the people in this great multitude were already wearing uh, white robes. We've already looked at that. And we've seen that these white robes are a sign of the purity and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which clothes everyone who receives him as Savior. So once again, the question was, who are these people wearing these white robes? And where did these white-robed people come from? Now, from this question, we can conclude some things. Uh, and we conclude one very important thing right off the bat. The other will have to come through a little bit more exposition. We'll get to here, God willing, momentarily. But when we're looking at these questions, let's don't jump to the answer. Let's first meditate on the question. 
because the question will give us some truths if we'll think about it. From this question, when he says, where did these people come from? We can logically conclude that this great multitude was not always standing before the throne. You see that? This great multitude was not always standing before the throne. They were not natives of the heavenly court. They have not always been standing before the throne and worshiping God. The elder asked, whence came they? For they have not always been here. And so we conclude, church, that the church of Jesus Christ has not always stood in the courts of her heavenly king. We have not. In fact, the members of the church were all born both enemies and strangers to our God. We have been separated from his presence because of sin. We were not always this joyful number standing in the presence of God, unafraid. We learned this morning about the fall of Adam in the garden. And we saw how when God came into Adam's presence there in that garden, after Adam had taken of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he ran and hid himself because he was afraid when he heard the voice of his God. That's where we all come from, church. We were not born into the presence of God. We were born outside the garden of his government. And speaking of this time that we were all born in, the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2.12 that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Whence came they? Whence came they? That's how we were born. And if you have not been born again, that's exactly what you still are right now. So understand that the sight of these once hopeless, alienated strangers now making themselves feel right at home in the presence of God and celebrating His goodness to them is indeed a marvelous sight. So what are these which are arrayed, arrayed excuse me, in white robes and Whence came they? Let's continue to see. Look down at verse 14. John answers the elder in verse 14. And, and I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. In other words, John replies to the elder and basically says, Sir, you know. Sir, why don't you tell me? Sir, please tell me who these people are wearing these white robes and tell me, please, sir, where they came from. Continue reading in verse 14. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. Notice the elder told John, These are they which came out. They came out. The elder said that this white-robed multitude came out of something which means that prior to them standing before the throne of God, they were in something, right? And what had they been in? It said they had been in great tribulation. Speaking of the time that occurs in the history of our world, immediately before the pouring out of God's wrath, and immediately before the opening of of the sixth seal, which we just got through studying about in the previous chapter, speaking of that time, in John, uh, I'm sorry, in, uh, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, Jesus said, for then shall be great tribulation. Now what did the elder say these people came out of? The elder said they came out of great tribulation. And so we can kind of get some chronology here through our study. Because Jesus speaking of this time of great tribulation in Matthew 24, 
said that this time would be uh, during the, uh, the time of the sixth seal. Listen to what he said in Matthew 24, 21. Jesus said, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And then, in Matthew 24, 29, Jesus said, Immediately after the tribulation in those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. In those things, the moon darkening, uh, the, the, the sun not giving her light, the stars falling from heaven, those things happened in the previous chapter. They happened at the opening of the sixth seal, if you'll remember. So Jesus said immediately after that great tribulation, then the events of the sixth seal will take place. And now the elder is saying, this is, who these, this is where these people came from. These people came out of great tribulation. In other words, they have been rescued out of that great tribulation, which we saw uh, the, the events of uh, happening immediately after that and the opening again of the sixth seal in the previous chapter. So it's apparent to me that this great multitude just came out of the great tribulation uh, that Jesus was speaking of in Matthew 24. And since the Apostle Paul said that the in 1 Thessalonians chapter uh, 4, verse 16, that the dead in Christ shall rise first. In other words, before the people are raptured out of the great tribulation, the dead in Christ shall precede their rapture. They shall rise first. Okay? And so, based upon that, I believe this great multitude consists of the believers in Christ of every age. Of every age. Because the dead in Christ, Paul said, shall rise first. Everyone with me? Now before we leave this portion of this scripture, I want you to take your pens and I want you to underline these two words. Came out. These are they which came out. Underline those two words. Came out. During this tribulation, the church will go through the fire. They will. They're going to be tested. And the word tribulation in the Greek, it means to be put under pressure, tested, put under pressure. When I was in the Highway Patrol Academy, they would put us under pressure because if you couldn't stand the pressure then, you wouldn't be able to stand the pressure when you got out on the road working by yourself. Put you under pressure and see if you would break. And this tribulation is putting them under pressure pressure, testing their faith, you see, putting them to the great test, which afterward will reveal who are true believers and who are not. But the church will go through the fire during that time. The church has gone through lots of fires over the years. They've been cast to lions, right, uh, thrown in furnaces. They've had the, been burned at the stake. Had their limbs cut off. The Bible tells us about that. And that's not going to change for us, church. It's not going to change. Yeah, the church is going to go through the fire, but we have those two words underlined, and those are the important two words, and that is come out. Come out. You see, we don't go into the fire to perish. We go through the fire to go to something else. They came out of great tribulation, and they went to... The Father's throne. Isn't that good? They came out of the fire. And they arrived at the throne. Yeah, the church is going to go through the fire, folks. But she will come out as gold. <coughs> she does. When Job went through the fire, Job was determined to stay true to his God. Job said in Job 23.10... But he, speaking of God, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, or tested me, Job said, I shall come forth. Another way of saying, come out. 
I shall come forth as gold. In church, this is the attitude that we must take. This is what every believer needs to determine in his heart. That when we are tried, we need to have that attitude, Lord, when I'm trying, though I'm in the fire right now, though things are difficult for me now, and at the times when this uh, great tribulation is taking place, and the church is persecuted, and believers in Christ are committed to prison, and the unbelieving world, or a religious world, by the way, is seeking to cut off the heads of those who trust in Christ and His cross, as they seek to do today. And as they grow stronger and stronger, and the fire gets hotter and hotter, then the saints in Christ need to have the heart of Job and say, when I come out, I'm going to come forth as gold. The church came out because when it comes to fiery trials, the believers always come forth as gold. As believers in Christ, we are overcomers. Remember what we've learned when Jesus led us to the church that preceded the, the text we're looking at now, when we first begin our study in Revelation, it begins with Jesus' letters to the churches. Remember? And he always says, to him that overcometh, to him that overcometh. And I told you back then that the Revelation is all about overcoming the world. Right? And this is the victory that overcometh the world, the Bible says, even our faith. It's all about overcoming sin Overcoming Satan. Overcoming death. And we church. Are made overcomers. Through him. Through Jesus Christ the Lamb. Through his death. His burial. And his resurrection. As believers in Christ. We are overcomers. And that simply means we cannot be overcome. The church came out of tribulation. But then they went to their father's throne. So when your path gets difficult. And when the fire gets hot. And when the pain seems like it's more than you can handle. And when everything inside you. And maybe even the world around you is telling you. Give up. Give up. Give up. Lose your faith in God. You always remember that as a Christian in Christ. You are not just going through something. You are going to something. You're going to the Father's throne. And when you do, you're going to come out of the trial you're in as God. The great hymn writer Martin Luther wrote this concerning some of the fiery trials he went through. He wrote, When through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie, my grace all sufficient shall be thy supply. The flame shall not hurt thee. I only design for thy dross to consume and thy gold to refine. Okay, we have seen where they came from. Now let's finish the verse. The elder said, These are they which came out of great tribulation, look back at your text, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The elders said they had washed their robes. You see, we learned something else now from the question the elder asked. Because the elder said, not only where did they come from, he said, what are these that are arrayed in white robes? We see here now, the elder answering the question, they came out of great tribulation, and why are the robes white? Well, they washed them. In the blood of the Lamb. And so now we have the second conclusion from the elders' question. And it is this. Not only had this great multitude not always been before the throne of God. But their robes had not always been white. <coughs> their robes had not always been white. And boy, I tell you, my robes have not always been white. And uh, I, I can't say I don't know about yours because unfortunately I do. Yours hasn't either. <laughs> These robes represent the conduct of men on this earth. That's what they represent. These robes represent our conduct 
on this earth. And our sinful conduct does what? It stains our robes. We were born sinners, separated from God, with soiled robes, stained with sin. But through the gospel of Jesus Christ, God has made a way for us to wash the stains of our sinful conduct away and make our robes white as snow. That's the gospel. The apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 through 11, he said, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? In other words, the unrighteous, they're not going to stand before the throne and praise the Lord. They won't inherit that. He said, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And then Paul says, pointing his finger at the church, and such were some of you. In other words, your robes were not always white. He says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed. Isn't that good? <laughs> Paul told that church, this was you before, but you're washed now. Because you're washed, you can inherit the kingdom of God. You can stand around the throne. You can be a member of this great multitude, which no man can number. Church, thank God. This question gives us this answer. We have not always been white, but we have all been washed. We've not always been white, but praise God, we have all been washed. And what have they been washed in? Look here, if you would, in verse 8. I'm sorry, not verse 8. Uh, look back in your text, if you would. It says they have been, they washed their robes, what? In what? The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. What has the power to wash away every sin that you've ever committed? Your past sins? Your present sins, and this is what believers in Christ need to understand, even your future sins. Right. When you're washed, you're washed all the way. What has the power to wash away our past sins, our present sins, our future sins, to wash away every last little stain of them? It says, they made their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. Now, that's interesting because blood's not white. Blood's scarlet red. It's dark red. And, uh, and, and blood stains things real easy. Luke, you probably know about that from the ER. But blood stains things real easy. And red stains are probably darker than any stains. Wine stains or something like that. So, blood is not... White, blood is red, so the elder, therefore, is not talking about a literal washing, you see. If it was literally washed in blood, then the robes wouldn't be white, they'd be red. He's not talking about a literal washing, he's talking about a legal washing. Washing the slate clean, you see, completely clean. The elder is saying that legally, when it comes to the blood of Christ, where blood is applied, sin is removed. Where the blood of the Lamb is applied, the sin of man is removed. The slate is wiped clean. When Christ lived on this earth, He lived a life that was free from sin. Metaphorically speaking, you could say His robe was spotless and it was pure white. Because his conduct on this earth always was in obedience to his heavenly father. When Christ died on the cross, here's what happened. When Christ died on the cross, God took your robe. 
And he put your robe on Jesus. That's what happened. Because his robe was spotless. There's nothing for him to die for. He's committed no sin. No crime against heaven's court. But you and I have. Remember, ours were not always wide. So when Jesus died on the cross, God took your robe off of you, your conduct, your life, that he knew you would live. Jesus died 2,000 years ago before we were born. God took every sin he knew we would ever commit. He took our robe and he put it on Jesus. And so Jesus died for our sins, our penalties. Putting that robe of, our, of your life on Jesus. When God saw Jesus, he saw a guilty sinner. He held court. And the king on the throne condemned the man on the cross. See? He was condemning you in him. He saw your life. And Jesus died for your conduct wearing your robe. And he did that. So that as he died wearing your robe. You could then live where he is. That's what this is all about. That he took your robe from you and robed Christ with your sin. He then takes Christ's sinless, spotless, pure white robe. And he offers it to you to clothe you. So you can stand before the throne arrayed in white robes. This is what it means to wash your robe in the blood of the Lamb. You see, the Bible says in the Old Testament, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when Jesus died, he gave his life. And that perfect, spotless, snow-white life of his came out in his blood. That was his life coming out of him for you. And that's what he's talking about by washing your robes in the blood of the Lamb. He gave his perfect life for you. He took your sinful life. He died for your sin and gave out his perfect life. So that through his spotless white blood, the life he gave for you, you can be robed in his. He stood before the throne when he was on the cross. He stood before the throne wearing your robe so you can be part of this great number standing before the throne wearing his. That makes sense? That's what we're saying here. That's why all the robes are the same color. They're all Jesus robes. They're people who've taken their sin stained life, treaded them in at the cross, and come out looking just like Jesus. <laughs> the Bible says we've been predestined. To be conformed to the image of his son. This is what this great multitude had done. It washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. But though white robes are definitely a cause of great celebration. They also serve as a sober warning for all of us here on earth. You see the fact that all these people. Every one of them were arrayed in white robes. That lets us know something. If you don't have a white robe, you're not going to be part of this number. That's right. You're not. It lets us know something. The fact that all of these people are arrayed in snow white robes lets us know that God won't accept any other color. You can't be part of this number wearing a black robe. A preacher, I'm not that bad. Or a gray robe. I'm not that bad. Or a brown robe. Not that bad. Or a tan robe. Well, maybe I am in the middle. Let me tell you, you can't be part of this great number even wearing a cream colored robe. Or even a slightly off white robe. The only robe God will accept is one that is pure white. And the only life that was ever lived with that conduct was the life that Jesus gave for you when he died on the cross. That's the only robe there is that you can be arrayed in. If you stand before God giving him your best, 
you're not going to be white because every life in here is stained with sin. <coughs> some worse, some less, but every one of us, our votes are, that is, every one of them are stained in sin. So if in your mind you're thinking, well, I'm, I believe I'm going to heaven because I'm doing the best I can. It's not going to work, folks. Unless you have been clothed in the pure white robe of Jesus Christ, you are not saved. You are not part of this number. You will not go to heaven when you die. You will be condemned. You will not be raptured from the great tribulation. You will not be raised from the dead and come out of the fire. You will forever endure it. That's the cold, hard truth. And that's the warning that the scripture has for us today. God, when Cain was upset because his robe was not accepted, metaphorically speaking, when God did not accept Cain's offering to him, God reasoned with Cain. He said, if you do well, won't you be accepted? If, if you go the way that I've given you, don't you think I will accept you? It's reasonable that if God offers you a free, pure white robe as a gift so that you can stand before him as if you have never sinned, clothed in the innocence and the life of Jesus Christ that he gave for you. That he stood judged in your sin, but you can stand free in his righteousness. If that is offered to you, wouldn't it be reasonable for you to accept it? And wouldn't it be, as Cain was, very much unreasonable for you to decline it? Once again, the only color robe they wore was unstained white. And I want to ask you this morning, if you do not know Christ as your Savior, will you wash your robe in the blood of the Lamb? Will you give up your dirty robe of your life and be clothed in the life of Him who lived? And died for you. That's reasonable. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18. God says this. Come now. Let us reason together. How about that? You see God wants to reason with you. He wants to say hey. Let's think about this. Let's be reasonable. There's no sense in us being enemies. No sense. We just got through with Christmas. Remember the announcement of Christmas? The angels, when they announced Jesus' birth, in their, in their announcement, they were announcing the whole purpose of it. They said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. In other words, hey, God didn't send his son to condemn you. He did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. God wants peace with you. You see? And God is saying here, again in Isaiah 118, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, meaning though they be stained with the darkest, hardest stain of all, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, God says, they shall be as wool. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, God is telling you, come on. Let's reason together. Let's be reasonable. Will you be reasonable to God? Will you reason with Him? Will you not listen to His reasoning today? He is telling you that even if your robes are stained with the scarlet stain of sin, He shall make them white as snow. He said, though they be red like crimson, they shall be as Wool. Wool. And rightly so, because the robe he offers you is the robe of a lamb. A lamb who died for you. Isn't that good? 
Can we have every head bowed, every eye closed? Please, no one looking around. Let me ask you this morning. I'm not asking if you're religious. I'm not asking if you were raised in church or raised in a Christian home. I'm asking you, has there come a time in your life where you recognized that you can't get your road clean enough through your own works? That you recognize your road with your life, no matter how well you try to live it, it is not acceptable to God. God is a perfect God. He only accepts perfect people. God has no stain, and he will not accept yours. Has there come a time in your life where you have given up on your life and you have received Christ's life instead? Where you have exchanged the robe of your sin, come to the cross, and accepted the life that Jesus gave for you. That you have understood that your robe was put on Jesus. And Jesus was condemned so you wouldn't have to be condemned. And he offers you his condemnation as a substitute for yours. Come now, let us reason together. Is it not reasonable that if one man has already died for you, that you should not also have to die for yourself? Is it not reasonable that if Christ paid your penalty on the cross, that you should not pay it yourself? Is it not reasonable that if your robes are stained and there is a white robe offered to you freely that you should not receive it? And is it not reasonable that you dare not come before the throne of God in a stained robe when there's a white one waiting for you? If you're not here this morning as a saved person, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, this is offered freely to you today. You can have the payment he paid. You can have the life, the perfect life that he lived. And you can be judged and stand before God no longer in your life conduct. But in the life of Jesus Christ who lived and died in your place. Your slate wiped completely clean. Because of what Jesus did on the cross for you. It's free. Will you wash your robe and make it white? Will you say yes to Jesus this morning? Will you say finally. I'm going to make that decision. To accept Christ. Right here and right now. I'll accept you Lord as my Savior. I'll put my trust in you. Is anyone here like that this morning? Just lift your hand up. No one's going to call your name out. No one's going to embarrass you. You slip your hand up. I'll receive Christ as my Savior right now. Anybody? Is there anyone here that says, Brother Richard, I want you to pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved. I'm not sure that I'm saved. Just pray for me. No one's going to call your name. Anybody? Just slip your hand up and down. Brother Richard, pray for me. I want to be sure. You want, Brother Richard, I know I'm not saved, but there's some something holding me back. There's some something I can't quite get past, and I want you to pray for me that God will take that roadblock out of my path. Just pray for me. Anyone like that here this morning? Just slip your hand up and down. Anybody? Let's close with a word of prayer. Church, let's stand. Always remember that all